So thank you all for coming. Um, we appreciate the, uh, the turnout, and uh, hopefully we'll give you some, some fun and good information uh, today. Um, I'm going to review some of the information that I've gathered since 2016, uh, working with some of these beer-related crops. Um, there was an awful lot of interest uh, from people in the state of Maryland uh, in crops like barley for malting and crops like hops uh, for making beer and uh, wanted to know what we were doing about it. And so we started doing a little bit of work and I'm gonna talk about that evolution and then some of my experiences as, as we've gone through that process. Um, I'm located, our research that we're doing is located at the Western Maryland Research and Education Center in Washington County. It's right next to the Antietam Battlefield. Um, my office is up there in the middle of the part of the state in Carroll County, but all the work that I'm doing with barley and hops is up in Western Maryland. Um, from an extension perspective, I was not interested in, in small plot type stuff or if it will grow or whatever. I felt like we knew, you know, barley will grow. And there are a lot of other researchers doing a lot of the finer detail work and are more suited for that. I felt from an extension perspective, I wanted to do this project in a way that could directly translate as much as possible to farmers. We've grown a lot of barley in my area historically. We've had a very large dairy industry for many, many years. Uh, as the dairy industry is leaving, the crop is also starting to fade away. And so this seemed like maybe this was an opportunity for barley particularly. Always have people looking for alternatives uh, like hops. And so again, that always, that, that kind of all works. Uh -oh. That all works into the plan. It was only a matter of time until I did that. Okay, so um, I really wanted to see how this would work and I wanted to see if it would be profitable. So we did the work on large scale. We did on four acre blocks. So all of the varieties that I planted, we planted them in four acre blocks. We harvested with a combine, we sprayed with our sprayer, we did all the things, we tried to do it as much in a production sense as we could. We used a producer across the road, helped us with cleaning, helped us with drying, helped us with bagging, um, so that we were doing this, we're going through the motions in a way that we could collect economic data, that we could really collect all the information and see if this would work out in the end. One of the first things working with the producers up my way was to help them to understand is that yes, they can grow barley, but if the barley doesn't get malted, the breweries don't care. The breweries want malt, they don't want barley. So we have to have that intermediary there. And there are three or four, depending on the day, uh, malt houses in the state of Maryland. Um, our brewery numbers have gone up significantly and everyone says they want local. And everyone says, you know, wow, you know, we, we really want to have local ingredients. We want to make this local beer. This is going to be a great marketing opportunity. People want this stuff. You know, we don't want it coming across from the, the other end of the country, all the carbon for, footprint, all that sort of thing. So let's have local ingredients. And so this is us meeting with our first producer that we ever had out to the research farm, uh, a, a, a malter, I'm sorry, a brewer in Frederick County, Maryland, Tom Bars, Milkhouse Brewery. And the first thing he says to us there is we're looking at the hop yard and we're very proud of the hop yard and we're really excited about the hops work we're doing. And he says, what about malting barley? What about barley? And it's like, my God, man, we've got this very expensive planting here and we've done all this work for hops. He wanted to know about malting barley. They wanted malting barley. So the second year we folded barley into our work. Um, this is one of the most important things to me in the world that I live in, sort of out in production with, with, with producers. They're paying, the breweries are paying between 40 and 60 cents a pound when they buy malt from out west. Okay, so when they're making all this beer, they're paying 40 to 60 cents a pound for the malt that they use. When we produce it locally, our local producers are around $1.20, but they're ranging from $1 to $1.50. These are businesses. They're growing fast. They're competing with each other. These bottom line types of numbers make a difference. And so what I'm finding is people are saying, yes, I want local stuff, but I want the same quality and I want it at the same price. And that's just very, very difficult to do. We do not have the infrastructure. We don't have the scale in the East to do that. So this is one of the important things I think to remember is a lot of these breweries will in the end go with the cheaper barley. They can still make a really good beer with the cheaper malt rather, not barley, but the cheaper malt. They can still make a really good beer, but they can spend a lot less to get that. So again, 
we looked at four acre blocks the first year. We did some thoroughbred, Scala, um, SYTP, and then a spring barley synergy. The second year we came back, we planted some more, we changed varieties a little bit, trying to follow the market where things were going. We added rye because the distilleries were very interested and wanted to know why we weren't growing rye, what we were doing with rye. We grew the AAC Synergy again, the spring barley. Um, and then 2019, we only had our spring barleys, Synergy and Odyssey. Um, we try to always, we don't try, we always follow soybeans to keep the fusarium um, inoculum down. <clears throat> so what happens is this year, 2019, because of 2018, we couldn't get the, the soybeans off in time to get the barley in. So we waited and then came around in the spring and planted our, our, um, our, our spring barley. Um, we're at about 1.7 million seeds with what we're doing. So we're, we're kind of kind of in there. Um, but that's sort, of, that's sort of the numbers we're looking at. And these are the varieties we've grown over the last three years. Um, again, I wanted this to translate out as much as possible. So we've got the, the, we've got the combine we use for everything else. Um, we're taking it across the street to, to a, a grain farm. Um, we're drying it, but when we dry it, when we have dried it, you cannot put heat on this stuff. So no heat. So we're trying to get in between their barley and their wheat, and we're trying to get this stuff dry with no heat. And it's in there, and it's in there, and it's in there, and it's in there, and it's costing a lot of money for us to run that thing, but there's no heat. You can't damage the germination by putting heat on it. So that was a problem. We were then cleaning it. So we rented a cleaner, we were cleaning it, and then putting it in super sacks. And that was the way we were, we were ending up with, with keeping all the varieties straight. <clears throat> we did not have enough bin space to put all the different varieties in. But we were really trying to manage it. Again, the key I always want to come back to is that we were trying to do it so if a farmer was interested in doing this, if Jeremy's going to do this, this is exactly what we did. This is how we did it. We did it with the same stuff that you would use, the same drill, the same sprayer, everything else. Um, I don't want to get into great detail here because all this stuff is available to you online after the program. But what I want to point out is we did not skimp on our weed control. We did not skimp on our insect control. We did not skip on fungicide applications. Um, we wanted to make sure we did this as well as we could. We scouted, we tried to do the best job using the best materials we could to get control particularly of the Fusarium head blight. Um, that was the biggest thing. Um, but we also had some cereal leaf beetle in there and some other little, little issues. But we really tried to do a good job here. We really tried to be on the ball and get that right. Uh, as far as fertility, um, we're trying to watch the fertility and be a little bit careful. I'm a little bit probably on the light side because I'm scared to death of high protein numbers. Protein is a reject and protein, if the number of the, the percent protein goes too high, it can never be blended with low protein uh, barley. To, to, you know, they blend a lot of grain obviously to get the numbers where they want them to be. But they can't really blend high protein in because they will germinate differently and they act so differently that if you've got high protein, it really puts you out of the, out of the ball game and you're going to get a reject. Um, so we've been a little bit conservative here. Our yields are not in the 100 range. We're, we're more into the 60, 80 range. Um, but one thing that I found that has been kind of cool is everyone told us that you couldn't grow spring barley in Western Maryland. And you can grow spring barley in Western Maryland. We've grown different varieties of it, and it's done fairly well. Um, so we send all of our, once, once we get all our yields and everything, we get everything cleaned and done or whatever, we send our samples to Michigan State University. And across the top here are the desi desired criteria, the different categories that they're going to look at. A maltster is going to evaluate your barley, or your, your barley and decide, you know, is this going to meet the spec? So the protein's got to be less than 12%. Your Don numbers have got to be less than one part per million, and so on. So our first year, if you look across here and you kind of you know, look at the numbers, we did pretty darn good. So I'm thinking, you know, we, we're, <laughs> this is all right. You know, we could do this. We can grow this crop. This is pretty cool. And so we were very excited. So we went back to the Maryland malt houses that were crying for this and said, we've got this really good stuff. We've got these different varieties. 
would you like to work with it? No. None of them took it. None of them had the capacity. We had too much. We had too much barley for them. They couldn't take it. They didn't want it. So we sent it to Copper Fox Malt House in Virginia. It's in Williamsburg. We worked with our partner, Flying Dog, who supports this work, Flying Dog Brewery in Maryland. And we send it out. They malted it. The numbers came back very good. We had all the malt analysis. And you saw the numbers before. Between a dollar and dollar fifty for local malt, we said, we're going to sell this stuff for a dollar. Everyone wanted this. This is sort of that intro. And by the way, all the proceeds are going to go back to the University of Maryland to support the research. So what percentage of that barley, and it wasn't a whole lot, what percentage do you think we sold of that malt to local breweries in Maryland? Less than 20%. Very low, a very low percentage. They talked a big game, but they weren't familiar. They didn't know the varieties. I don't know, this and that. It all ended up in beer, and it ended up in some very good beers, but very few local breweries supported us. So they're talking a big game, but they're not spending their money. So that was a real eye-opener to us as we're trying to work through this project because they're telling us they want us to do it, but they're not willing to help and to support us. So then 2018 happens, ba-boom. I had a Don problem. And you can see it's off the chart. We had 74 inches of rain at that farm. We did spray, um, we sprayed Corumba. Um, we thought we had the timing right, as right as we could. Um, we did the best we could with drying and cleaning, and it even got a little bit worse sometimes when we dried it and cleaned it. So it was pretty much a disaster in 2018, and we had nothing that could be used. So that was kind of disappointing. So then we came back in 2019, but because we couldn't get the beans off, we couldn't plant our fall barley, so we planted spring barley instead. We did really well, except we didn't dry it. We did not, we did not go through that final step because we were kind of running out of money on this project. So we didn't dry it with no heat. Um, and we ended up with our RVA numbers. And, and Vic's going to go into a lot more about what these different numbers mean and, and why they happen. But basically, this is the capacity for the barley to be stored for a long period of time. And the breweries in Mar or the malt houses in Maryland are so small that they have very limited capacity to store anything. They want their, mar their barley that they get to be able to be stored for at least a year or two years. So they want this number to be a lot higher. They want it to be over 120. Basically, this is just saying that this stuff has been exposed to conditions that it could germinate sooner than later. And they don't want that to happen. We knew that if this barley had been used within a month or a couple of months, it would have made great malt. But none of them were in a position to be able to use it. So again, as far as the Maryland side goes, none of the, none of the malt houses could handle it and none of it was used. So this is just, again, and all this information is available to you, you know, when you, when you, if you are interested in looking this up later uh, on the internet uh, for the pro, from the program. But from, from my perspective, so far, we're, we're losing money on this crop pretty consistently. Um, our expenses and what we're really doing, our real labor, our real equipment, our real expenses, we're not doing very well right now in Maryland with this crop. And it would be worse than that because now a lot of times we, well, we're, we're ending up selling it for feed pretty much every year. Now, the people that buy it for feed are very happy. They like it a lot. It's great feed, but it's a little disappointing to sell something for, or feed it to your pigs. Yeah. You have very happy pigs. Uh, so then, back to kind of what I really am, am working on a little bit more intensely or with a little bit more vigor. I've been working with hops. Um, this is more of an alternative crop, obviously. This is, again, one of those kind of cool, sexy crops that you hear a lot about. This is a crop that probably does not belong in Maryland, although before Prohibition, about 10 to 20 percent of the hops that were used in Baltimore in the breweries were grown in the central Maryland area. Um, so we're all kind of in a zone where hops can be produced, but that was very old genetic material. The last 75 years or so, all of the breeding that's gone into hops has been to have them grow out there on that high desert out west. 
4% humidity, hardly ever rains, you know, great conditions as far as tons of light, a higher latitude, longer days. That's what they've really bred for. And sort of this, this, this eastern swamp that we live in is, not, is, is way less than an ideal condition for hops. Will they grow? Yes. They will absolutely grow. Is this profitable? I don't know. Is it hard? Yes. Is this something to have on a farm that people say, I'm going to go up to Ann Becky's farm uh, in Allegheny County on every other Sunday and we're going to manage this crop? It will be a disaster. Um, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. But you can produce hops and we have made beer and we've, we've had success. But I think something that's very important to note is if there's ever a shortage of hops in anywhere, the Pacific Northwest will respond and will respond very quickly. They will meet the demand whenever the demand occurs, and they have so far with the craft industry. There have been some gaps, but generally speaking, they've been able to meet the demand, and they meet it with a lot of proprietary varieties too. So varieties we can't even get a hold of. So if we think that we're providing like a real hole in the market, we're gonna fill that or whatever, that's not really what we're going to do. If there's a niche or a novelty, uh, yes, maybe there's an opportunity here, but we're going to be more expensive, we're going to be more variable in quality, and we're going to also be more variable, bless you, variable in quantity. Um, and these things are expensive. These, these are, are expensive crops to grow, hops are. There's a shot of me throwing the first hops we grew into the brew. Um, I have to show that picture I'm under contractual obligation because if anybody knows me, I can tend to run my mouth. And I told these people that this was a stupid project and it was a failure and never worked. Well, it kind of worked. So the brewer said, well, you've got to show that slide every time to show them you can grow hops in Maryland and you can make beer. And we did make beer with those. Actually, it was this test yard beer here. Um, we've had some success with different varieties uh, of hops. Um, so we're kind of excited. We somewhere seem to be rising to the top pretty consistently. Um, there's some kind of interesting things going on. Uh, Flying Dog has become our major partner. Uh, the Brewers Association and other breweries have not really stepped up very well to be very supportive of the work. They expect us to do it for them, but they don't understand we need money to do this expensive stuff. But Flying Dog has, and so they've been a, a wonderful partner. The problem is, has anybody, well, I'll just tell you, trying to get an MOU with a business, an industrial company, and the University of Maryland is a nightmare. It's been two years to develop this partnership so that we could work together and talk about what we were doing. For the first two years, I was not allowed to say the word beer. I wasn't supposed to say beer because, well, we don't do alcohol. Well, we're doing an agricultural enterprise and we're pretty far removed from beer, but we need the beer or we're not gonna have anything. This is just a quick layout of the experiment, what we're doing. We started with 12 varieties. People got very excited initially. Um, the next year they wanted us to put in 12 more varieties um, because there were some varieties they felt that we missed. So there are 24 total varieties in the experiment. There are three replications. There are six plants in each replication. Um, we tried to prepare the site well. We tried to do all the things that a good extension agent would say to somebody. This is how you get things ready to go. We tried to do it correctly. One thing that is absolute with this crop, without a question is, if you don't have good irrigation and plenty of water, do not even consider it. They have to be irrigated very, very regularly. They are real hogs for water. They love the desert, they love the arid conditions, but they need water. So if, if you're working with anyone or anyone's interested and they don't have irrigation potential, drop it out. These are the varieties that we're growing. This is what the hop yard looked like initially when we planted it. We tried to use some nice uh, laminated poles uh, we invite people to come in to look, to see what we're doing, to test the hops, to look at things uh, anytime they want to come. One of the things that we've worked with quite a bit is different timings for cutting the plants back. Um, you have to, the plant will start to grow in February and March, but you have to cut it back so that it doesn't grow too much. So finding the date that you cut that plant back so that it hits that top wire and then starts to make laterals and create hops has been a kind of a balancing act. The dogma was it had to be April 1st, but we've been all the way out to, to May the 9th and we've had some very good results. But you can really mess yourself up. So this is a big part of as we move forward with the work. If you're too late, if you crown too late or cut them back too late, you get a little Christmas tree. 
So you get sort of a, a little thing fat at the bottom, narrow at the top, doesn't hit the top wire. If you don't crown them back at all, they don't make any hops until the last, say, six feet up. And then they wrap around and they make a big mess in the top of the plant. And you can't get them down. So what we want is a nice column of growth. Obviously, water is a big issue. Rain, 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 disease pressure. Um, it's just some things here about training. We start out with one string, and then we end up going to two. We end up with four binds. These are binds, not vines. They're binds because they don't have tendrils. Uh, they wrap around the strings. So we start out training with two, and then we end up getting up to three, or two or to three per string up on a nice V uh, per plant. Uh, disease and insect issues. This is mite problems here. This is a serious problem we had with two-spotted spider mite. These look pretty bad. We talked to um, the brewer at, at Flying Dog. They said we would never buy these hops. They look so bad. But when we tested these and we ran them through the lab at Virginia Tech, they came back and they were perfect. So you're really, you're harvesting the lupulin inside. And that's really, that's the, the glands inside, the yellow stuff. That's what you're harvesting. That's what they're using. But the appearance was important. So as with so many things we do and sell, if it looks bad, people aren't going to want to buy it. So you're not going to get a premium price for a crop that looks like that, even though you can make some darn good beer with those. So again, this is all information you grab later, but this is our 2016 spray schedule. Kind of big. There's our 2017 spray schedule. A little bit larger. Got that? Are you ready? OK, next. 2018. Oops, had to drop the flaunt and go to two, had to go to two columns. Got it? OK, 2019, I just shrank it again and went back to one column. This is a crop that will grow. I've had people that come up to me and they say, I grow them in my backyard. I do. Yes, they will grow. They will grow with little care. But if you're trying to harvest one to 2,000 pounds of dry matter per acre so that you can be profitable, they require intensive management because they are real prima donnas. Mites do a lot of damage. Um, leaf hoppers do an awful lot of damage. Japanese beetles do a tremendous amount of damage. And a product as simple as seven, which is very effective for Japanese beetle control, is not labeled for hops because they don't have Japanese beetles out in the Pacific Northwest. So they don't care about that. So we fight these pests with products that are either hammers that lead to other problems or with, with pixie dust, which cost a lot of money and don't do a good job. So we do struggle a little bit, but organic would be extremely difficult. The way we harvest, um, cut them down or cut them back. We run them through a, a mobile harvester. Um, we get them in and get them dried down from 65% moisture to 8% moisture in 24 hours. We process them, we pelletize them, we get them vacuum packed and frozen. We've gotten some pretty good yields. We've got some varieties that are approaching 1,500 dry pounds per acre. Um, but the real thing that I wanted to point out is that half acre cost us almost $52,000 to establish. And these are our maintenance costs over the last three years. So between three and $5,000 for a half an acre. And if you notice the thing before, it talked about $10,000 an acre. So we're, our numbers are right in. But as I close quickly, because I've run out of time, you got to end on a bright point. A hop was given to us that's been growing in central Maryland for over 100 years on a farm. It has not been taken care of, but they've made beer with it for every, every year they've made beer this family has. It's called Lion. This hop grew well in our trial this year. We put it in, it grew well, and it ranked fifth of all the hops we grew. So out of 24, it ranked fifth in quality. And it's got some yield potential too. So we're very excited that we have found an old hop that maybe we can resurrect and bring into this and maybe we can make something out of that. All right, well, uh, my name is Victor Green. I'm with the University of Delaware Research Forum in Georgetown, Delaware, Sussex County, not too far away from here. Um, see, I do a lot of talk. Um, most of my most of my talk is going to focus on, uh, or and my experience has been when proximity malt came to Laurel, Delaware, uh, which is uh, for our area anyway, an industrial scale malting facility. 
uh, roughly about five years ago. That's when we started. We had always been doing barley work at the, at the research station, uh, but that's when we started doing malt varieties. Um, so bef before I get going, I'd, I would like to credit a um, retired uh, extension agronomist from Maryland, Bob Cradville. He's been a, a big help to me in, in learning about this crop. Uh, also some growers and crop consultants, at least one of them's in the room right now. And I really appreciate their interaction with me and it's kind of uh, put me in the real world of things that they have to face uh, rather than being in the small plot world of, of the university. Um, I probably, I, I've definitely learned a lot more from them than they've learned from me. So uh, with that, this is uh, one of our plots we, uh, we host and Maryland does too. Uh, the winter malt barley trial, uh, which is a nationwide trial that malt barley breeders few and far between um, have, uh, there's 30 different varieties of malt, specifically malt varieties. And then that goes into a nationwide database uh, that they can use looking at, uh, mostly looking at yield, but um, they'll also take some of the samples and malt them and, and eventually brew them up probably for the, some of the schools, uh, at least up in North Dakota State or Minnesota or Michigan State where they have those facilities to do that easily. Uh, before I get going, uh, these, this is Proximity's um, discount schedule. It's something we, growing malt barley is not, not difficult. It's pretty, or growing barley is, is not difficult. It, it's pretty easy. Uh, growing, delivering malt barley uh, and getting a paycheck for that is difficult and these are, this is the discount schedule uh, that Proximity has published. You're looking at good 95% germ, low protein, under 12%, uh, low vomitoxin, under 1%. So those are things that have been really ground into me that you really have to pay attention to with this crop. Uh, I know that's difficult to read but that's our uh, results of one of our variety trials. Uh, thoroughbred is, is, a, is a six row variety. It is officially a malt variety. It's out of Virginia Tech's program. Um, pretty good yields, uh, but I w the reason I put that up there, I, I wanted to put Flavia against thoroughbred. You can see it does compete and it's sometimes it's hard to believe that some of these two rows can be competitive with the six rows. And I, I've looked at some of the other variety trials, Virginia Tech um, and others recently, you would be surprised some of these two rows really can compete well, some of the better two rows can compete well with the six row varieties. I also want to call attention to that harvest moisture because I'm going to talk about that later. That, that's my, my yields are uh, converted back, uh, I did convert them back down to 13.8%, but I do want to call attention to that harvest moisture, which is pretty high. If you can't say it, I'm going to say it's probably averaging 16% which is pretty high. Again, here's another trial we did last summer, uh, Thoroughbred, Flavia, and Violetta. I'm gonna talk, mostly the focus of my talk is those three, three varieties, uh, Flavia and Violetta in particular, because that's what Proximity is writing contracts on. It's my understanding they will also take Thoroughbred, but, the contra but they won't write a contract on that. That's the way I understand that. Flavia and Violetta are both two rows. Th again, Thoroughbred is a six row. And you can see the yield reduction if you were doing an enterprise budget, if you were considering growing it. Uh, roughly in, in this trial, Flavia is about a 10% decrease in yield. And in this one, uh, Flavia is, eight, I believe, 18% decrease. And again, pay attention to that moisture at harvest. It's pretty high. I'm going to talk about that uh, at the end of my talk. Uh, the, these uh, varieties that we're growing, uh, I, I really need to talk with Matt Musial, who's the maltster at Proximity. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're using uh, some, some wheat consultants to pick their varieties. They're certainly looking at, at our, uh, not, not only Delaware's uh, variety trials, but, but elsewhere. Some of these varieties do well in the mid-Atlantic, uh, while, while others don't. Um, but Flavia and Violetta have consistently done very well in the mid-Atlantic and uh, both are selected to be an official uh, malt variety, which means they meet, uh, have good malting characteristics, good agronomic characteristics, and good brewing characteristics. So uh, for those of you who don't know, two row versus six row, two row is on the left, six row on the right. The two row uh, tends to be uh, 
sought out uh, by the maltsters in the United States. And my understanding is that Europe uh, prefers six rows. You can malt six rows, two rows. You can malt any kind of barley. But uh, our area specifically is looking for two rows. There's various reasons for that. The maltsters would have to get into that. Uh, generally, the two rows have lower protein than the six row. Uh, generally, they're plumper. They're more uniform. And uniformity is something that's sought after in the malt house. Uh, the reason for this slide, I wanted to show the difference in size between a two-row kernel versus a six-row kernel. The two-row is on the right. You can see how uh, large that is compared to a six-row with the central. That's one side of the six-row. Those are as if the, uh, think of that as if it's just split in half. Um, you got a central spikelet with its two lateral spikelets. And, and you can see how uh, small those, all three of those kernels are compared to the one on the right with uh, a nice plump kernel in the middle uh, with uh, its infertile spikelets, which is labeled B. So that's how the two rows, the better two rows can compete with the six rows. Again, same thing, two row on the left, nice plump kernel versus the three row on the right. Um, you got your central kernel with the two lateral spikelets, quite a bit smaller compared to the, to the one two row. Still hard to believe uh, that the two rows can be competitive. I, I don't say that there's not a yield decrease by any means, but um, they can be competitive in terms of yield. Let's talk more specifically about planting, some things you want to look for Ideally, you'd be planting into uh, soybean stubble, uh, not corn stubble. Uh, many of you know corn stubble tends to have uh, fusarium inoculum. Um, so ideally, you'd be planting. There has been more, more and more people planting early soybeans where it's possible to do for us. Um, but ideally, you'd be planting so into soybean stubble rather than corn. That said, I, I pretty much have been planting after corn and uh, been having some good success with that. Um, Ideally, on our sand in Sussex County in Georgetown, low organic matter soil, I'd like to plant a, a pH of a, a soil of above 6 pH, maybe 6 to 6.4. Our soils are high in phosphorus anyway, so that's okay. We're putting out potassium, and I'll show our recipe here in a minute. We're putting out 30 pounds of fall nitrogen with some sulfur, with some potash. Um, I do recommend some fall nitrogen on this crop. You do want to pay attention to nitrogen. However, we are, uh, you don't want to over apply it, but um, 30 pounds seems to be roughly what most people are putting on for this crop in the fall. Uh, I would be concerned about um, planting this crop into a field board, uh, because it'd be difficult. You never know how that manure is going to break down. And you do need to account for how much nitrogen you're putting on this crop, because you do need to worry about keeping that protein level down. Uh, we're planting one and a half million seeds um, per acre. It's 35 seeds per square foot. Uh, we are using a seed treatment. I would recommend that uh, fungicide and insecticide to get a little early season aphid control, pythium and rhizoctonia control. Uh, so there, we planted it, the crop's coming up, it's looking good. Um, crop school wouldn't be the crop school without showing the, the old growth chart, wheat growth chart, small grains growth chart. For those of you who are entering this profession, you should, you should be aware that you need to be able to stage uh, crop growth and many of these chemicals completely depend upon the correct timing, which you have to be able to do. So that's why I put that out there. We can kind of go through this crop real quick um, we did a, I am applying a fall herbicide. This is the first time we did this in the past. I've been doing spring, spring applied herbicides. I think I'm going to have a little more success with wheat. The crop is growing pretty vigorously right now. It's getting good vegetative or the weed. And, um, I'm going to get better coverage right now versus, uh, later in the spring. So we, this is our first time doing that. I, I think it's going to work out well for us. Uh, be aware on our winters in Delmarva, you never know what you're going to get. And uh, we've had winters 
where it gets quite warm and you do want to be on the lookout for aphids. If it does get warm, uh, aphids spread barley yellow dwarf virus. That's something to be concerned of if we do have some real long uh, warm spells. Um, looking for powdery mildew uh, in early spring. Um, let's pretend we're, we're kind of going in through, we've made it through winter, we're gonna apply nitrogen now in the spring. At the university in Georgetown, we're putting out a total of 100 pounds in two top dressings. One uh, typically in mid-February, just prior to green up, and then uh, coming back a little later in typically late, uh, late March. I, I've top dressed uh, this crop in January when we had, had a really uh, excessively warm winter. So you're not necessarily doing it on calendar date, but you gotta do it when the crops uh, and the temperatures are telling you you need to get out there and do it. And um, you always wanna be on time with everything you're doing. Um, so again, that's, that's the crop growth stage. I want to talk about the heading and some fusarium here in a second. Um, so uh, I guess I, let me spend just a second on nitrogen. Uh, we're doing two timings of 100 pounds in Georgetown. I wouldn't, I, I think that's probably correct. Jared Miller is going to be doing some research or, or agronomist at Delaware is going to be doing some research on nitrogen application. Um, rate um, rate and timing this spring, which I look forward to. It's been, re Bob Craddeville has recommended uh, less than that, about 80 pounds, and I think they've been successful. I think that's on maybe some better soils than us in Georgetown. Um, I've not had any problems with protein levels getting jacked up with uh, spring applied 100 pounds total nitrogen. And I'm gonna show my, res my lab results to prove that in just a second. So we got to talk a little bit about fusarium head scab because that's one of the quality factors that you, you must meet for this crop. Uh, Virginia Tech is doing some work with a misted nursery. There is some resistance in barley. I wouldn't count on it to, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't count on that to think you're going to get away with not spraying a fungicide, but there is some, some degree of resistance and they're doing some work with that. Flavia. Uh, this is some work by Cornell, is rated susceptible to uh, fusarium. Oops, what did I do there? Oh, um, thoroughbred is rated moderately susceptible, and Violetta is rated moderately resistant. Again, I, I would take them with a grain of salt. I, I think it's, I think you almost have to, if you're really trying to, to uh, sell to a, a, a malting company, I would urge uh, a fungicide because um, what happens in, in late spring in our area, the, the weather report is basic, the weather forecast is basically 90 degrees, scattered thunderstorms for the next two weeks. And that, that's pretty, pretty typical in our area. Be aware of the Fusarium Head Blight Prediction Center out of Penn State University. It's a good website. Um, you can put your area, your region in and, and kind of track uh, if conditions or environmental conditions are conducive to fusarium. I wanted to put this up for some of the newer people. This is one of the, one of the differences between wheat and barley. There's not very many, but wheat will flower after it comes out of the boot while barley will stay, uh, will actually self-pollinate in the boot. I've got a, there's a description of the feek scale there on the left, it's kind of detailed. That's the same picture, that's barley. On the left, it's in, in the, considered in the boot. Coming out of the boot is the next picture to the right of that. And the third picture from the, from the left is actually the correct timing. That's fully considered fully headed, and that's when you would want to spray a fungicide. The right picture is, it's a little bit late, although they're, they're uh, with, with the newer herbicide, with the newer fungicides, Miravis Ace, you, there is a little bit longer application window now. But just be aware that you really need to uh, time your chemicals with the crop growth stage. Talking about harvest. You've done everything right. Let's talk about harvesting. Um, let's talk about test weight. One of the things you can do to maintain a high test weight, frankly, is to put the crop under irrigation so you have a little bit of control over moisture. Uh, barley is not a thirsty crop. However, uh, in, on Delmarva, 
you never know what you're going to get when you get into spring. It's nice to have the ability to irrigate. We, frankly, we had to irrigate this fall. It got so dry. Uh, in, we didn't have any, hardly any uh, rain in September. We had to irrigate to plant um, this fall in, on Delmarva, or we we did at the research station anyway. Um, again, test weight, uh, you can you can at least control it somewhat with, with some irrigation. But environmental factors, some of which are your, are your, out of your control, but they play a role in test weight. Um, applying a fungicide will help you maintain good test weight. Those are some factors in test weight. Again, you need to, a place like proximity is, is wanting a test weight uh, above 46. Here's the crop as it's drying down. Um, barley is, is notorious. Uh, it'll, it'll do what's called nodding. It'll go from a perpendicular uh, position and it just start kind of slowly nodding to roughly a 90 degree angle as it dries down. Um, note, note the awns for those of you who are not familiar with this crop. It, it's got very um, prominent awns, which are sometimes difficult uh, to remove uh, harvest with the har with the combine. I've had a tremendous amount of difficulty uh, removing those awns with our little plot research combine. I've, I've had a lot of problems with that. Speaking of harvesting, um, I, I did point out the crop moisture. I, I'm probably harvesting it too wet. I, it's been ingrained in me to get this crop out of the field. You don't want it out there because potentially, again, we're getting we're getting weather forecasts of thunderstorms pretty much every day when you're ready to harvest is normal in our area. And um, potentially if you get some rain on that crop, this crop is made to sprout. It's made to sprout very easily. And so it's been ingrained upon me to get the crop out when it's ready. However, I do feel like I've been premature in, in harvesting too early. I don't have to, I'm not delivering a tractor trailer load to a place like proximity, I'm just growing 17 foot plots. I can put a bag in the greenhouse. It's easy for me to go out and harvest early. It's not easy for a grower to go out and harvest early. So I think I'm, that's one of the things I'm gonna do differently is wait for the crop to dry down a little bit more. I think I'll be able to harvest it a little easier, remove that on and, and do a better job with, with uh, harvesting it. Um, this is outside of my, I, I don't, we're not, again, I don't have a dryer or storage. I don't, I don't have a great deal of experience with that. It's been recommended to me by a grower, this guy out of North Dakota State. If you do need, if, if you are considering growing this crop, I, w I would want to have a plan on how you're gonna dry this crop because it's gonna be up to you if you do need to dry it. And um, this guy was recommended to me. Uh, he's got some video, he's an ag engineer from North Dakota State, which is a leader in everything in malt barley. Um, I believe Matt Musial, who's the maltster at Proximity, attended North Dakota State. Um, so this guy would be uh, someone I, I would recommend if, if you were uh, a grower considering this crop. Basically, the bottom line, uh, you can do a lot of damage with heat. Don't put heat on this crop. Um, that's one of the big quality factors that will destroy your germination percent in this crop. So be careful with heat. There's my secret recipe, uh, basically everything we talked about. Um, Brian kind of talked about it too. Not, nothing special there. I'm gonna talk again, there's proximities uh, discount standards again. We have to meet all those standards or you're gonna be docked. Here are my, uh, Brian put his lab analysis from Michigan State. These are mine from last year. And I'll be honest, I, I could have cherry picked some better data, but I wanted, to, I wanted to show you what I felt to be my mistakes so you aren't making them or maybe you can do a better job. But let me point out some good things first. My protein levels are excellent. They're all under 12%. So I'm, I, that's how I'm gauging. That's why I say confidently that I'm doing a pretty good job with, with my nitrogen, how much I'm applying. I've got four years of data. I've never had any go above 12 doing a good job with, with uh, fusarium, vomitoxin, it's all under 1% one per, one or one part per million. That's pretty good. I, I've had very a little, um, surprisingly little problems meeting that criteria also. Very surprisingly, in fact, 
our former pathologist, Nathan Koscheski, would told me I, I was just getting lucky that the crop was ev evading the disease. Uh, we would have rainfall come maybe after the crop had already matured. And he, he's probably right about that. Maybe I was lucky, but I've got four years of lab tests and my Don levels are quite good. RVA, we talked a little bit about that. RVA is rapid visco analyzer. That's the tool they use to measure that. Uh, they're measuring pre-harvest pre, pre sprout. Um, and that's the ability to store the crop. And uh, you want above 120 for the most part of meeting that pretty well. Um, and what, what can lower your RV, RVA is uh, if you are getting rain on a crop that's ready, that's mature, and you're getting rain, say we get a week of rain, which we, we have had around here, and that crop sprouts, your RVA, RVA levels are gonna go down. Now, they will accept uh, RVA levels below 120, but you do start to get docked and it starts to red flag things at the malt house. What I wanted to pay a little bit of attention to, germ. Uh, you want germination above 95%. The four mil, that's your basic standard germ test with water. You can basically put 100 seeds in a wet napkin and petri dish under controlled conditions. Did 95% of them germ or not? Um, capacity is where they're looking at, let, let's ignore that middle eight mil number for the purposes of this discussion. Germination capacity is a measure of future germination. Some seeds need a little bit of dormant time. Most malt seeds do not because they've been selected to germinate easily. But capa malt germination capacity is, a they're using hydrogen peroxide to break down that seed coat a little bit, and that's a measure of future germination. Again, you want that above 95% also. As you can see, I'm not meeting those, those uh, characteristics at all. And um, there's, it really um, made me uh, look, at, look at the way I'm doing things. I thought I was doing a great job. If you look at my yields, they're fantastic. I, I thought, wow, I'm really an expert. They're going to ask me to speak at the crop school every year about malt barley. But in reality, when you look at these lab tests, I'm doing a poor job and I need to do better. I need to do the same. Uh, I need to be at the same um, quality standards that a grower has to meet. And I feel like I'm over threshing the crop when it's wet with our, our combine. And uh, that's something I'm going to try to do a little bit better on. Um, So I wanted to be upfront about some things you need to really worry about if you are growing this crop. That's Bob, Bob Cradville's uh, recipe for growing this crop, everything we pretty much talked about. Again, I, I did want to acknowledge him. He's been very helpful to me. In summary, treat this crop as you would uh, as if you were growing a crop for seed. The seed must be viable. Payment is based upon germination and quality factors. So with that, um, I'm done. We'll be happy to take any questions if anybody has any.